Well, this morning as we get into the Word of God, we're going to be reading a, different, a couple of different passages of Scripture. And this first one is a quick one verse from Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the love of God on display. Remember, specifically at Easter, we remember whenever we speak the name of Jesus, whenever we have a a crucifix, whenever we see a cross on a building, whenever we open the word of God, we see his love on display for us through Jesus Christ. And here it says, while we were still sinners... In other words, it had nothing to do with us, nothing to do with your effort, my effort, the building you're in today, the history of your life and family. He's saying, I did that because of me, not because of you. That's the thankfulness we can have in Jesus Christ today. So it, Jesus is God's greatest gift to us, greater than even the gift of physical life. It gives us hope of eternal spiritual life beyond our time on this earth. So while we still have breath on this earth, we are still to turn our attention to Jesus, still to give him praise, still to intentionally be laying down our life before him and living in obedience to him. That's the life Jesus lived that we are to model. And he said, I've done this all for my father. I considered myself to be humble as a man on this earth, not to be equal to God. I listened to God the Father, and I did what he did. I didn't do what he said don't do. And so here, it says, God gave us this gift without us ever deserving it. Eternal life, love, forgiveness of sin. He said, I'm doing this for you. He did it simply because he loves us. That's great love. But it's not enough just to receive it. We've now got to share that love with other people. We have to share it with one another. We've got to share it in our homes we have to share it in our workplace. We've got to share it in this church. And then we've got to also share it with anyone and everyone. Whether we like those people or not, we have to still love them. Why? Because we're living life as Jesus. Therefore, we are to be Jesus to all people. And Jesus loved us while we were still enemies. While we still considered him unknown to us, he still loved us and gave his life for us. So let's go and do the same to all people. And this sacrifice of Jesus came at a great cost to God. For Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. Not just some sin, not just, you know, the really easy sins or the really bad sins. It came all sin from all people, from all time, all at once, for your sake and for mine. Then Jesus, who had ever only known life, needed to die undeservedly in our place. This is who we remember specifically at Easter. This is what we remember happening specifically at this time period. And yet scripture says this is God's free gift to us. He didn't put a price tag on it. He didn't say, well, you have to earn your way to get this one. This is like top level achievement. He's saying, no, 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 I'm giving this to you because I love you. This is my inheritance for all those who choose to live their life for me. It cost him so much, he chooses to make it freely available to all who choose to believe in him through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this gift, once again, is not simply just for us to enjoy. Oftentimes we have that gift. I got two boys. You saw them up here earlier. You know, they get a gift and all of a sudden it's mine. All of a sudden, no, you can't touch it. Don't even look at it type of scenario. And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we're like that with Jesus. We're like that with salvation. We're saying it's mine. I'll be one way in church, but I'll be another way when I'm talking to someone else about whatever. Because we we have this personal aspect of our faith that kind of almost overshadows in a wrong way our public aspect of our faith. Because Jesus says, I want to make my salvation available to all people. I'm doing this for all people. I want to make my name known. I want to declare Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit above and beyond any other name. I want to be lifted high. We find this in so many places throughout Scripture 
where he wants us to share our faith, not just keep it to ourselves. We've often talked about how the things of earth are designed to reflect the things of heaven. One of those places is found in Matthew chapter 22. And coming out of a time of restrictions here ourselves today, we as a society have been starved of so many of our social interactions. Now that we are free to do so, let's be intentional about opening up our homes to one another. Let's be intentional about opening up our hearts to one another, opening up our life, opening up our faith to one another in this community. Even over distance, we can open up to people. We don't need to keep it to ourselves. We don't need to be all protective of it. God says, I've given you more than enough. I want you to continue to share. I'm going to overflow myself in your life. You'll have all that you need and more. Share some. Share, with, share me with someone else. Oh, I'm not going to tell you to have people over for Easter dinner. I'm just saying, you know, the Lord says, hey, there's a time of opportunity here in your community. Let's be fruitful and multiply. Let's share my love with other people. Let's tell them the reason for the season. Let's expose God's greatest mystery that Jesus has now come, and he has come for all people. In Matthew chapter 22, we see that God is preparing a feast for his son, and he invites all of us to attend. See, God could have had a feast, just him and his son, one-on-one, and enjoyed a great meal together, celebrated their victory over sin and death, and gone on to whatever might be next. And sometimes we might be like that. We can see, oh, we just got the family over. We got the usual friends over. The same, oh, we're going to invite more people? I'll, I'll text the same five, or whatever that might be in our scenarios. And But God wasn't like that. God says, I'm not just going to have it just be those who are already with me. Let's go and invite people from the alleyways. Let's shout it from the rooftop so everyone will know that they are invited. It's not what God wants, just to have a communal, inclusive meal, or exclusive meal. He wants it to be inclusive. He wants everyone to know they have a seat at his table. He literally says in Matthew 22, the invitations go out to the good and to the bad. In other words, those that are easy to get along with and those that are hard to get along with, those that have wronged us and those that are our favorite people in the world. He's saying, I've invited everybody. And if we look at ourselves today, we haven't always been good in the eyes of God. We don't set the standard. Pastor don't set the standard. Church don't set the standard. God sets the standard. And so in the eyes of God, yeah, we might have fallen short many times. But he says, you're invited. You're invited. My arms are open wide for you. Come all who are, who are weary, and get, I'll give you rest. It clarifies, though, at the end of Matthew 22, that you must be clothed in wedding clothes in order to enter. But what does that mean? It means that you must still choose to be clothed with the forgiveness and acceptance of Jesus Christ. There are those who are here, hearing the invitation, but they're not accepting what God would have for them. They even make it to the table. And then God throws them out in Matthew 22 and says, you're not, you're not supposed to be here. You're not clothed. Sometimes in a church, we can kind of say, well, I'm, I'm just fitting in with the crowd. I, I'm here. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. I made it to the table. And God says, but you haven't really surrendered yourself. You're still doing things your way. You haven't fully accepted my forgiveness. You haven't fully accepted my love for you. Do you want to make your way to the table of the Lord? Give your all for Jesus, just as he gave his all for you. Now, with today being Palm Sunday, we remember specifically Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, as described in John chapter 12. The people were praising him and spreading the word around the city about all that Jesus had done. It says specifically, they were telling people about Lazarus getting raised from the dead. They had just come from the countryside. They had just traveled in with Jesus. But they didn't stay with Jesus in, in a sense. There were some that did, but there was many others who had heard Jesus was coming or who were with Jesus and ran on ahead. And they were knocking on the doors of every home. They were shouting from the corners of the square, Jesus is coming. He's on this street over here. Come join us. They were willing to share the message that Jesus was coming. No matter what they'd received, they knew that Jesus could give them what they desired and still have enough for other people. They'd seen it. They'd heard about it. They'd experienced Jesus. 
And so that excitement, they knew that other people needed to hear about Jesus that day. And so they went and they told people. They invited people. They didn't just say, oh, do it on your own time. He'll be here all week. They said, come now. They said, it's for you. He is for you. He's got something you want to hear today. And so they continued to spread the message. Enough so that it says the Pharisees took notice and they said something that was meant to be taken negatively, but it's so positive when you hear it. it they noted, the Pharisees noted, the whole world had gone after him. There's more to that phrase because it's time of Passover. And during a time of Passover, people had come from all around the known world at that time to, to, uh, to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem in God's holy city. And so there's people from all around the world. The Pharisees are looking and saying, oh, no, oh, no. Now it's not just a small crowd of crazy guys. Now it's everyone, it seems, from all different countries together. And they're here in Jerusalem. They're here to worship at the temple. And they're all following Jesus. The whole world has gone to follow him. And they're upset. They're depressed. They're confused. But it's a celebration because Jesus is making his name known one more time to as many people as possible before his time on this earth is done. It's a celebratory scene. It takes center stage for a moment. Passover was a festival where the people remembered God saving them from death by the spreading of a pure lamb's blood over the door of their homes while they were slaves in Egypt. And just like what happens on earth is a reflection of things in heaven, Jesus was about to take what they were remembering in the physical and have it show greater spiritual and eternal significance. See, Jesus, the pure and sinless Lamb of God, was going to shed his blood over the door of the hearts of all those who are slaves to sin, who choose to believe and accept him as Lord of their life. And Jesus was not just going to save his people in this life, but in the life to come. There's also deeper understanding to be seen within his death as he just speaks to those in Jerusalem immediately after he rides in. See, most of the time on a Palm Sunday type of message, we stop at Jesus riding the donkey. But what happens in John chapter 12, verses 23 through 33, is Jesus addresses the crowd. They're all celebrating. They're all gathered together. Everyone's there. All this stuff I just said has been happening. But then the noise quiets down. Jesus gets off a donkey, stands in a place where people can see him. He positions himself. People can hear him. And then he speaks to the people that are there. It's not enough just to be able to see Jesus. It's not enough just to be able to hear of Jesus. Now that people are going to experience Jesus. Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, and anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. It's an interesting message when he has the attention of the crowd, the known world represented at his fingertips. And he says, I'm going to die this week, but it's for your benefit. He starts out with the farming analogy, saying that the kernel of wheat, it's only, it's only useful for itself. It's only useful in one situation. You kill it, you put it in the ground, and it spreads out. There's seed for many more. There is many more grain heads that I'll pop after that. He's referring to the fact that he needs to die. He needs to be lifted up so all people's attention will be on him so that God the Father will be glorified. He's saying, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He's saying, this is happening for you. 
It's bigger than me. I could call the name of the Lord to save me, but I won't. I won't. I can't. This is my purpose on this earth, to glorify the name of the Father, that you would be saved through me. It's a salvation call on Palm Sunday from the mouth of Jesus. And then it continues something interesting we often don't hear about, and that's in the latter part of verse 28. It says, Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. God speaks audibly here on Palm Sunday in Jerusalem as everyone's gathered around listening to Jesus. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And then Jesus addresses it. He says in verse 30, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. They have Jesus there in the physical. They're listening to him talk about his death for their benefit. They hear God's voice audibly speak from the heavens. And still, Jesus will be abandoned by every single person there before the end of the week. We can ask for signs from Jesus. We can put all kinds of ultimatums before him. He's heard it all before. What he's looking for isn't your undivided promises that will just say, oh God, I'll do this if you do that. He's saying, I want your action. I want your obedience. I want your heart. I'm doing this for you. Will you surrender it all for me? Just as Jesus had to lay down himself for others, so we must follow in his example and do the same. We lay down our desires and love others as Christ loves us. We surrender our ways and become obedient to God in every circumstance. We put the will of God as first priority in our lives, spending time with him daily, so that we even know what his will is. And here we see that even though Jesus knows his time of pain and suffering is just around the corner, he continues preaching to as many as he can, both on Palm Sunday and in the days to follow. He also acknowledges that his pain and suffering is simply temporary, where the glory he will receive from God the Father is eternal. That's not just for Jesus' sake, that's for our sake. We go through hard times. We go through times we don't understand. We go through times we expected things to be totally different. But Jesus reminds us, all eyes is temporary. The glory you will receive in God the Father will last forever. There's no comparison for our suffering when God's glory is in the mix. Therefore, there is no excuse which should ever keep us from being obedient to God. Invite us to bow our heads where we're at right now. To reflect on what has been shared. To reflect on what God might be speaking to you about in your heart. As the people at this time were preparing at Passover to thank God for saving them generations before. Let us now here take some time right now to thank God for saving us forgiving Jesus for our sake. So just take a few moments, 30 seconds even, and just say, God, thank you. God, I thank you for Jesus. God, I thank you for saving me. God, I thank you for choosing me. God, I thank you for seeing me as I am and not giving up on me.